Traditionally, the military has meant this, soldiers, and war has been your men against my men. But today, military strategy increasingly involves computers, and war is becoming your computer versus my computer. How have computers affected the military, and how has the military affected computers? We'll get answers to those questions today as we begin a special two-part look at computers and the Pentagon on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by AFIPS, the American Federation of Information Processing Societies. AFIPS, along with these constituent societies, brings you the National Computer Conference, NCC 86, offering a showcase of advanced technology and the industry's foremost professional program. For conference information, call 800-NCC-1986. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover the latest in microcomputer technology worldwide. Byte, the international standard. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe, and this is Gary Kildall. Gary, we're watching the ancient art of war here. This is a game we can see the old art of war involved bows and arrows and swords and so on. Today, war is really computers on one side and computers on the other side. How important really has the defense establishment been in the whole area of computer research? Well, Stuart, whether we like to acknowledge our heritage or not, the Department of Defense funding has been very important all along the development of computers. Right from the very beginning, where computers were used to compute ballistics tables through the uh, investment in the space program, micro miniaturization, microchips and all that. Very important. Gary, today we're going to take a look at the Pentagon's role in computer research. We'll look at simulations, we'll look at robots, intelligent weapons and Star Wars. We're going to begin with a background look at the Pentagon's role in computer research. Not long ago, Silicon Valley went into a slump with computer companies looking at red ink and layoffs, bankruptcies and auctions. But for one group of companies, the military contractors, business is very good and it's getting better. From smart missiles to the Strategic Defense Initiative, or Star Wars, the computer business is booming with defense-related projects. Pentagon spending in the Valley jumped $500 million in 1984 to over $4.5 billion and increased again in 1985. Layoffs at semiconductor manufacturers are in sharp contrast with new employment at defense contractors. Up 4,000 people at Lockheed Corporation alone. Analysts estimate that anywhere from 15 to 30 percent of high-tech workers are involved with defense-related work. Critics worry that the trend away from commercial products to direct military applications will thwart the young industry's reputation for taking innovative risks. But those within the industry don't think so. The government will fund research, whereas the private sector is not interested in funding research. Um, now, the, the military and the government uh, has particular goals for that research, so they're not just funding it for its own sake. but. The uh, government, in particular the Defense Department, has a very long-term perspective on research. They don't expect to see results of your basic or applied research for 10 or perhaps even 15 to 20 years. That simply is not true in the, the uh, private sector. In a mass raid, high-speed bombers could be in on us before we could determine their tracks. And then it would be too late to act. We cannot afford to take that chance. It is to meet this threat that the Air Force has been developing SAGE. The, the Pentagon's long reach into high tech is nothing new, as this film from the 1950s demonstrates. SAGE was a computer system built to track aerial intruders for the North American Air Defense Command. It was built at a time when military projects occupied 60 to 70 percent of the high tech workforce. Even the earliest mainframes were designed for military purposes. The ENIAC, shown in this 1946 film clip, has a place in history as the first general purpose electronic computer. It was also funded by the U.S. Army to calculate shell trajectories and to produce artillery firing tables for wartime use. 
even if it did take two days of programming for a 20-second calculation. In the United States, much of the advanced research in computer technology is paid for and directed by military agencies. The Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, funds research in the outer realm of technology. DARPA is credited with developing the building blocks of modern computers, from microcircuitry to the mouse. Critics of Pentagon-funded research voice concerns about the way projects are financed and the danger of relying too heavily on military funding. Unlike the lean startup that relies on venture capital, military contractors are guaranteed a profit called cost-plus financing. And still unanswered is how the push for military computers will affect our standing in the international race for computer supremacy. One of the earliest uses of computers in the military was in the development of simulators for aircraft. While flight simulators have been around since World War II, the early models were mechanical. The computerized simulators were developed in the early 1970s. Today's simulators include extremely sophisticated graphics displays and give the instructor almost complete control over the student pilot's environment. One of the leading companies in computerized flight simulation is Singer Link. The Lynx simulators have been developed for military aircraft like the B-52 bomber, the C-130 transport, F-16 and F-111 fighters, and the Huey and Cobra helicopters. At Indiantown Gap, Pennsylvania, a Singer Lynx simulator is being used to train pilots on the Huey or UH-1 helicopter. The system uses two Honeywell 790 mainframes to process a variety of analog and digital inputs. We feed um analog information, analog input information through the ADD converter into the 790s where it's distributed by cockpits. It's shuffled to number two 790 which performs the equation of motion calculations given back to number one and outputted to the hydraulic cylinders, the cyclic, the pedals, the instruments. So control movements from uh, inputs that change with time like the cyclic, the pedals or throttle position are analog inputs. We have digital inputs from any switches, um, switches for DI's, uh, switches for the radios, are all digital information input to the computer. The challenge for the computer, of course, is to make the simulation realistic, and that means enough computational speed to update the displays in a meaningful way. There's two type of inputs to the computer, DI's and AI's. There's two type of outputs, AO's, which vary with time, and DO's, which are either a logic on or off. The, uh, Every one of those is updated in the computer uh, 16 times a second. So we have an I.O. update rate of uh, 15.625 milliseconds, or one, every 1 64th of a second, it does one mode of the interface. Okay? So all switches, lights, instruments, and inputs are updated one, every 1 16th of a second. While early simulators were thought of as second best to actual in-flight training and used primarily to save money, the military says the new computerized simulators are not only cheaper, but better than the real thing. Virtually everything you can do in the airplane, you can actually do in the simulator. Um, it does represent flying in the clouds. Uh, we do not have any visual capability on this simulator. However, one of the added benefits that we have is the introduction of emergency procedures. Uh, we can actually uh, input 108 different malfunctions into the computer, and it will show up in the cockpit. These are malfunctions that uh, would normally be catastrophic in the airplane and could not be practiced. Uh, we have had at least two recorded saves up to now where individuals have practiced some of the emergency procedures in the simulator, uh, have learned them to a very high degree, and have subsequently had the same emergency in the aircraft. And they attribute their saving the aircraft and, of course, the people's lives in the aircraft with their actual simulator training. The newest generation of computerized simulators feature sophisticated displays that not only give the pilot detailed visual feedback, but also simulate the use of the plane's weapons systems. One of the first applications is on the Army's Cobra attack helicopter. That system, since it's so advanced in technology, will have a visual display, and all the weapon systems on the aircraft can be operated. Uh, the benefit to this is um, the weapon systems are so expensive to operate and ammunition is so expensive and the limited areas that we can actually train in are so far away 
uh, that they will be able to fire the weapon systems and to stay proficient in the weapon systems by using this. As I mentioned before, uh, very rarely does, does a Cobra aviator get a chance to fire the, the tow missile uh, because of the cost and because of how, how big a range area you need. Well, here in the, in the simulator, he can fire tow missiles virtually all day long. These computerized simulators are designed to train men to operate sophisticated military equipment. But in just a minute, we'll take a look at military robots that don't need any men at all. This may not look much like a tank, but someday it could evolve into one as robots become an increasingly important part of America's military strategy. This is Terrigator, an ALV, or Autonomous Land Vehicle. It's being developed here at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. CMU's Robotics Institute is working on several aspects of robotics under a grant from DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. While the work here is basic research, the military applications of an autonomous land vehicle are obvious. If you're in a, a new area where you don't know the terrain and you don't know the, what uses it has been put in, for example, there could be mines planted in a, in a field. If you, even if you send a tank, with people in it, you might in fact risk lives again. And again, an autonomous vehicle, an autonomous tank, which might conceivably you know, go do the same thing, would in fact save lives. While the Terrigator has very limited and specific functions, the scientists here are thinking about more sophisticated ALVs, futuristic robots that could actually become the soldiers of the future. There can be a droid or, uh, that is dropped, and which is self-protecting. Uh, you know, if you've been seeing the Empire si Strikes Back, you know, they, they have these little droids that are dropped, and they are completely able to protect themselves. They shoot back, and they're able to sense who is there, and so on. But they're, you know, but they're mainly you know, able to survive, and even their destruction serves a purpose. That, uh, the fact that they're not able to communicate back shows that there's an enemy of superior intelligence that has been able to destroy a weapon of this type, which then tells you something about well, who you're dealing with and in what situation. One of the fundamental questions being studied here is how should robots move, on legs or on wheels? Right now, the betting is that wheels will win. We built a six-legged vehicle, and now we are in the process of building a, a, a robot horse with four legs and, and gallop and do various kinds of gates. And, but a large part of our research is wheeled vehicle research because we think that is still going to be 80, 90 percent of the need. Uh, just because birds fly a certain way, you don't build airplanes the same way. So just because people walk doesn't mean you have to build robots that walk. But wheels present lots of problems. To move quickly, a robot may have to spin around. Not an easy task for a robot with old-fashioned wheels. So researchers here have literally reinvented the wheel and come up with one that goes forward and sideways. Another major problem in robotics is the sensory systems. The most simple human task can seem to be an impossible one for a robot. If a system has to go open the door, and go outside, go through the corridor. We don't know how to do each of those steps. Opening the door without tearing the knob off is a very major problem. And you know the sensors, the touch sensors, and being able to, for a robot to feel and, and think and understand and, and do the right thing are things that have never been done before and will require many, many years of you know, very sophisticated scientific research, if you will. And in the process, we will create a, an understanding of a technology which will lead to household robots, perhaps, which will you know, take care of the home and sweep the floors and open, answer the doorbell and get you a cup of coffee and all of those things. But the biggest problem for computer scientists here is vision. In order to open the door, you have to sense what it is there, where the knob is. And you can, if you look at that knob, you can see there are specular reflections. Those reflections make it appear as though there is a, you know, a whole image of the whole room appearing on that little convex surface, which confuses the, uh, the image further. And then after you decided that it has a round shape instead of an you know, oval shape, grasping it is a problem. So there's a lot of image processing 
and a lot of data that comes in, and then a lot of thinking and interpretation that goes on in the environment. And then doing the actual task may be relatively simple compared to all the other things. Researchers here are approaching the vision problem from every possible angle. There are one-eyed robots, two-eyed robots, and robots with one eye which scans from side to side, much like a lizard. And there are robots with multiple vision systems using video eyes, laser scanners, and sonar systems. But that creates a software problem, a problem of computer intelligence. That is the key problem in artificial intelligence, one of the key problems in artificial intelligence. Namely, if you have two experts, or two sensors, or two knowledge sources, telling you completely opposing things. One of them says there is an obstacle here, another one says the road is clear. Whom do you trust? You know, how can you know what you do not know? You know? People seem to somehow manage to make decisions under uncertainty and giving a computer the same kind of plausible reasoning capabilities is something we're struggling with. We have simple solutions to it but the problem is by no means solved. Perhaps the best example of the complexity of the vision problem for robots is what happened to Terrigator one day while trying to follow a simple path. The path had a curve at a spot where there was a tree. The robot's computer is programmed to essentially follow a path in the middle of parallel lines. So the robot tried to walk up the tree thinking its parallel lines were more like a road than the curves of the actual road. The hardest problem is the problem of deciding what it is that you're seeing, the problem of vision. You know, in the human brain, almost 30% of the human brain is dedicated to looking at a visual scene and interpreting it. That's a lot of computational power. And we still don't understand how to do it very well. And uh, we have been working at it for now 20 years. And I expect we'll work at it for 20 more years. While researchers here in Pennsylvania are trying to solve the problems of robotics, across the country, computer scientists in California are working on the military applications of artificial intelligence. In just a moment, we'll take a look at an electronic scout, so stay with us. At Advanced Decision Systems in Mountain View, California, Artificial intelligence takes the form of a tactical expert system that can assess threats, plan, and advise with the help of a knowledge base. A prototype system for a pilot's assistant is uh, particularly exemplary of uh, the sorts of applications that we feel are important for the military and also why they require so much research and such a long lead time compared with commercial products. What we're talking about is a system to help uh, a pilot, say a fighter pilot, and the system that we've built has multiple expert systems in it. They operate in a distributed, near real-time environment. So each expert system is receiving information. That information flows through the system in the form of intermediate requests and uh, decisions, and eventually some of those decisions pop out to the pilot. This prototype pilot's assistant is an onboard advisor, complete with synthetic speech and graphics displays. Data flows between the situation assessor, monitoring the aircraft and potential threats, the pilot's interface, and the planning module, which will advise the pilot on the best course of action. In this simulation, the aircraft is following a valley along which are SAM missile sites. If the pilot requests a preview, the system's area map locates and displays newly detected missile sites along the plane's flight path. The planner charts a new route and recommends an attack. The pilot agrees to the plan, but the situation changes when an enemy helicopter is detected. The flight path is again changed, then a missile launch is detected. The plane is hit. The system health module receives sensor data and makes a damage report to the pilot. The planner advises a new battle strategy based on the remaining capabilities of the damaged aircraft. The pilot's assistant is an example of a wide range of similar expert systems for air, ground, and sea warfare, being sponsored by the DARPA Strategic Computing Program. Strategic computing will require a tremendous leap in the practical use of artificial intelligence. 
Uh, I believe that military applications, especially military applications of artificial intelligence software, are the most challenging applications anywhere. Uh, the real-time aspects of um, handling sensor data are a growing problem. Uh, the United States and its technology base has produced us lots of very good sensors of various types, and these sensors produce mounds, uh, hundreds of, of gigabytes of information, and there, there are no humans around that can uh, sit down and, and actually look through all that information. So we have to ha find a way to boil that information down to its essence and provide that to a field commander or to a uh, decision maker in Washington. For the battlefield commander, effective decision making means a well-informed, fast response to the challenge of judging the quality and risks of surrounding terrain and the best path for men and equipment. AI systems can help with these challenges, sifting through masses of information selectively and quickly. ADS is working on a battlefield commander's assistant, featuring a multi-attribute display that operates like an intelligent geography database. The system can display a background and identify its natural and man-made attributes, from forests and grasslands to agriculture, cities and towns. The operator can then add layer upon layer of selective features, rivers, roads, bridges and other potential obstacles. But the BCA is more than electronic cartography. If the user picks a region and denotes a vehicle type, the system can determine the maximum speed through that area. And from various points on the map, the program will display line-of-sight information from those spots, painting out areas which can and cannot be seen from the vantage point, areas which could hide enemy units. Defining the best path through a battlefield is perhaps the most critical of BCA's talents. Ultimately, the reasoning powers of the system will help field commanders to plot the safest route through a battleground, based on physical obstacles and by determining the most likely locations for an enemy attack. In the Random Access file this week, IBM in the news again, this time with a prototype of a speech recognition system for the PCAT. A year ago, IBM had demonstrated a speech interface using about $2 million worth of mainframes. This week's demo was on an AT with only several specialized circuit boards. The IBM system takes about an hour's training to learn the user's voice. It can then understand 5,000 spoken words with a reported accuracy rate of 97%. The product is not yet on the market. And with the PC portable rumors out of the way now, there is yet another rumor that IBM is coming out with a new low-end machine to replace the PC Junior. Sources say that IBM's new totally automated manufacturing facility has made it possible for Big Blue to come up with a respectable low-end PC for under $1,000. The machine reportedly would have two three-and-a-half-inch drives. The fallout is still coming down on the PC convertible announcement, and as expected, most of the interest is in the use of the 3.5-inch drive. Already, most major software houses have said they will be coming out with 3.5-inch versions of their leading software products. Floating Point Systems of Oregon has announced what it calls the fastest computer in the world. It's a new 64-bit parallel processing machine based on hypercube topology. Its top-of-the-line machine can perform 262 billion operations per second. It has 16 gigabytes of main memory and 4 trillion bytes of disk storage. A smaller version of the machine has been bought by the University of Michigan. The largest machine, costing $200 million, may be used in Star Wars research. Time for this week's software review, and here's Paul Schindler. This is one of the great events in computer software history. Now, I know it just looks like modern, up-to-date documentation for a good software program. But you see, it's a great event because it's modern, usable, up-to-date documentation for the best IBM PC word processor, Xyrite. You see, when the old red light over the camera goes off, I write for a living. I'm senior West Coast editor of Information Week magazine, and they expect me to produce. So I produce. The reason? I use Xyrite. I know, everyone thinks the word processor they use is best, but this one is. I said it was best, I didn't say it was perfect. But in version 3.0, which you see booting up here, they added usable documentation to an already top-notch word processor. These screen colors just happen to be the ones I chose. Online help, available by typing alternate F9, is an extensive and easy to understand. It'll reorder your directory by date. That's the way I prefer mine. 
Xyrite has its faults. It's a memory hog. Even with great documentation, it takes a long time to learn to use it. But you can't outtype it, and you can't outgrow it. And printer support is great. Zyquest in Bedford, Massachusetts runs the best telephone helpline in the business. Zyrite, for $300, it's worth a look. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Paul Schindler. In our legislative update file, the telecommunications trade bill is making its way through the legislative maze. Three versions of the act are floating around Congress right now. In general, they require sanctions against countries which erect trade barriers against American telecommunications technology. In California, the state assembly has approved a study of VDT health hazards. Three quarters of a million computer terminals are used in California. The study is due to be completed next year. In England, the libraries are using a new computer system to keep track of which author's books are borrowed. Under a system called PLR, royalty payments are then made to the authors based on the number of times their books are borrowed. The computer also obviously provides a kind of top ten of borrowed authors. According to the British computer, the top three American writers in England are, in order, Harold Robbins, John Steinbeck, and James Michener. Finally, there was a demonstration in Washington last week, but it had nothing to do with Latin America or South Africa. It was a demonstration of math teachers protesting calculholics, students who use calculators and computers, but who have no basic math or arithmetic skills. The protesting math teacher said calculators should be banned from elementary schools so that students will learn how to add, subtract, and multiply. That's it for this week's Chronicles. We'll see you next time. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by AFIPS, the American Federation of Information Processing Societies. AFIPS, along with these constituent societies, brings you the National Computer Conference, NCC 86, offering a showcase of advanced technology and the industry's foremost professional program. For conference information, call 800-NCC-1986. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover the latest in microcomputer technology worldwide. Byte, the international standard.